Superfoods for the soul. How many remember when things like veggies and stuff were kind of looked down upon? You know, it's kind of like, eh, that's rabbit food. I don't want any of that stuff. People are like, give me a big hamburger. Give me beef. And all of a sudden, it seemed like a few years ago, the new thing was to find superfoods. Superfoods. Foods that were good for your, your physical man. Foods that made you healthy. You know, we used to think, like I said, salad was rabbit food. Something like lentil and beans were perceived as poor food and not as good food. Although lentils and beans have some of the best complex carbohydrates and, and, and proteins that are plant-based that are so good for you. But today now we tout the superfoods. And in fact, chefs all over the place try to go to these superfoods, incorporating them in special dishes to, in, to help people to see the benefit of eating right. Not just having a vegetable with your meal, but eating right, things that balance together to help you out. I don't know if you know, but a lot of these foods in the physical realm, they help us out with things like high blood pressure, and they help us out with cancer-fighting agents, and, and they help with lowering sugars. I mean, if you take cinnamon in your meal, if you put cinnamon in your oatmeal, if you're not throwing the sugar in it, the cinnamon helps level off diabetes, sugar levels in for diabetics. Avocados are healthy fats. They keep you from absorbing f the bad fats, and they help you to absorb the good nutrients. So all of you guacamole lovers, like myself, that's an amen. And also tomatoes, tomato sauce for the Italian to me. I used to wonder why I didn't see so many Italians with heart disease, but you can actually buy, if you have tomato sauce on a regular basis or tomato product, like healthy tomato product, the lycopene can actually reduce the chance of heart attack by 34%. Eggs, which were once considered to be bad because of cholesterol, have now been recognized as one of the purest and best sources of protein because they're high in protein and low in calories and they fill you up. Walnuts and salmon and their omega-3s, they're good for you. And then how about those things like, bro okay, did you all know that broccoli sprouts and Brussels sprouts are some of the greatest cancer-fighting agents that are out there. They help their antioxidants and those things help flush your system out of the things that are bad to keep people from actually getting cancer. Also, things like cauliflower and blueberries and apples. So, superfoods for the body, those are a good thing, aren't they? We should take care of these bodies, shouldn't we? You know, I work. I know every now and then we give in to that, that hamburger, you know, and every now and then we do those other things. But, you know, you try. We should take care of the health of our bodies. But at the same time, I think that some people in our world have kind of started to look at that thing, the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, that's something that we teach our kids in Sunday school. It's so nice, the fruits of the Spirit. Those are just, those are nice things that everybody should have in their life. I want to talk about the fruits of the Spirit for the next couple of weeks. Because really, they are superfood for the soul. If we allow the Spirit to grow these things in our life, then they have the ability, just like broccoli sprouts and Brussels sprouts can fight cancer, and lycopene can help your heart and your arteries, and salmon can help your, your brain and the fatty acids and the, the, the good fats that are needed for your brain, just like those foods can help you physically, superfoods for the soul can help you spiritually. They can help drive out the, the, the bad out of our lives. They can help drive out the temptations in our lives. They can help drive out the things that we need to cleanse from our lives. And so I want to talk about those because if we allow the Spirit of God to manifest Himself in our lives, then we can possess that spiritual power that comes from superfoods for the soul. And we cannot be weak as Christians, but instead we would be strong as Christians. We also would not only be victorious in our lives, but our lives and how we interact with others would have a more victorious and powerful effect. Are you with me this morning? Yes. A couple of you. How about the rest of you? All with me this morning? Amen. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such. There is no law. These fruits of the Spirit in our lives can release God's power in us and through us. So I want to start off with probably one of the greatest of them all. And I want to start off by talking this morning about the power of love. Who doesn't like love? We're coming, what are we, about two weeks away from Valentine's Day? 
So it's about two weeks before Valentine's Day. Y'all see the, the heart candy and the Valentine's Day cards and all those things to promote romantic love and to promote Valentine's and love and all that goes good, warm, fuzzy feelings. And a lot of times when we think of love, we think of it just like this world thinks of love. It's sweet. It's delicate. It can be, it can be trampled on easily. You can break hearts easy. You can be swayed to love someone maybe when you should or should. But we often view love in this world with an incorrect picture. Because the world's love is not the same way that God loves. Amen? In fact, the Bible mentions three different kinds of love. And Valentine's Day is all about the love called eros, which is where we get the word erotic. This kind of love is not really based in selflessness. It's actually based in selfishness. It's love that is based upon physical attraction. It's love that is based upon desire. It's love that's based upon wanting something from another person. And I don't know about you, but just like there are good foods for the physical man, there are also bad foods. Now, most of us don't like hearing this, but you know, bad foods for us. Wheat, sugar, any white refined carb. Those things are bad for us. They actually don't do good. They crave us to want more food, to eat the wrong things, and they're bad for our systems. They can cause these to be inflamed. And the same thing, the wrong kind of love, is not always good for us. Now, I'm not saying, because husbands and wives, you should have some romantic love in your life where there's a problem. Amen? Amen. 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 God designed you for that purpose. But we have to realize, if that love inside the marriage is not balanced with the love of God, then it's off balance. And it's going to have issues. Love that's simply based on physical stimulation and attraction really feeds selfishness and cravings in our life. Proverbs 5, 1-6 to says that Solomon said, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may... Preserve discretion, and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable. You do not know them. Very clear, Solomon. And you know, if anyone should have known, it should have been Solomon, because he had like between his wives and concubines, are like nine hundred. So he had, for being the wisest man to ever live, he didn't apply that wisdom in his own life. And he saw his own destruction from it, to be honest with you. But he talked about the need. In fact, he'll go on later to say, let the wife of your youth be the one that satisfies you in your life. Because if our only focus on love, and let's face it, how does the world focus love? When you watch a TV show or a movie, or even listen to a singer on the radio, what is the focus of love? It's not about an unconditional love. It's not about a perfect love that's God's love. It's about a sexual love. It's about physical attraction. It's about physical stimulation. And that's not how God wants to focus our love. And the, likewise, the Bible talks about a second kind of love called phileo love. Which, if you know the city of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, they call it the city of brotherly love because the, that Greek root word for, um, for uh, love that is phileo, and it is all about that love that you might have um, between a brother and a sister, between a good friend, even between a parent. But how many of us know that even that love can have its own issues? Even that love can abandon another person. Even that love can break down. It can only go to a certain point, and, but if it's tested by trials, if tested by, by, by hardships or disagreements or, or disfavor, I mean, I, I just watched the breakdown, even in, sometimes in the body of Christ, because of political differences, where we break down our brotherly love and stop loving one another because of political thoughts. You know, that should never be the case. But we often allow those types of things to come in. And if it's not about my need, my wants, the way I think we should think, we can sometimes even allow those friendships and those, those sibling relationships and other things to break down. Because phileo love still is not perfect, but it's still somewhat conditional. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 21, he says, Now brother will deliver a brother to death, and the father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. He was talking about how things would be in the last days, about how families would be broken down because of ideology and thoughts and the way people think. I think we see this in our society today. It's a scary thing, isn't it? Because God doesn't want us to be that way. There's a lot of weakness in the church. When all we do is apply 
brotherly love instead of God's love. Because it doesn't always stand the test of trials and struggles. But the fruit of the Spirit, and the word for love and the fruit of the Spirit, is agape love. I'm sure you've all heard this before. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard the term agape love. It is God's love. It is unconditional love. It is the superfood of the fruit of the Spirit. Because this love is unconditional. It is perfect. It is how God has loved us and how he wants us to love each other. Are we willing to put that love into effect? This is what the Bible says about agape love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. I'm sure you've heard it before and you'll hear it again. But let's look at it because it never, it's always good every time we read it. Love suffers long and is kind. Did you hear that? Love suffers long and is kind. How often do people abandon relationships because they don't want to suffer? Friendships, churches, marriages. But it says love suffers long and is kind. Yeah, but they're not being kind to me. But love says we're kind. Love does not envy. It doesn't say, it doesn't go, you're the haves, we're the have nots. Or we're the haves and you're the have-nots. Love doesn't parade itself. Look at me, I'm better than you. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity. In other words, when someone falls into sin, it doesn't run out and tell everybody about it. But it rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Amen. If you have any question about that, just look at you and Jesus. And the fact that he would die for you anyway, in fact, of the times that we have failed him, and the fact of the times that we make him suffer, in fact, of the times that we sin against him, he's patient with us, he's kind to us, he holds on to us, he puts up with us, he bears with us, and he hopes for the best for us. But God wants us to have that same kind of love in our lives. In fact, he says, if the Spirit of God is a part of your life, if you're a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit in your life, then this love should flow out of you. Now, I know we fail. I know as Christians, I fail, you fail. We can all fail at being perfected in love because until Jesus comes, we're not going to be fully perfected. But what the Bible is telling us is that God wants us to strive towards that place of having His kind of love. Think of what it would be like if we would seek the Holy Spirit to empower us to love with that unconditional love in our marriages. And if it wasn't just all about my needs being met, but realizing that my spouse also has needs. Think of what it would be like in family relationships between siblings and parents and children. Because after all, our love demonstrates to the world who we are in Christ. Think of what it would be when we treat others out in society with that same kind of love. Unselfishness, thinking no evil. Not rejoicing their sins or their failures, but in truth. Not jealous of other people. Not flaunting what we have. Not being egotistical or thinking so high of oneself that you look down on others. Tolerating differences that we may have. Now, I want to let you know that tolerating differences does not mean excusing sin. Because real love calls out sin. Do you understand what I'm saying there? There's a problem in the church today that we're like, we want to be so tolerant because we're supposed to love one another. Unconditional love is love someone who is still in sin. Because the sinner still needs to be loved. The person still lost in sin, if they haven't surrendered to Jesus yet, we still need to love them because they haven't found Christ yet. But it doesn't mean that we excuse the sin away. 
Because if they continue to live in that sin, their end destruction is hell. So is tolerating what they're doing so they end up in destruction? Is that loving them? Or is that really hating them? Or feeling com- loving, feeling comfortable? So sometimes we have to do what's uncomfortable, but we have to do it not in the form of judgment, but we have to do it in the form of drawing and loving people to see them come to that place of repentance. Because love believes God's best in other people's lives. You know, it's rich in antioxidants and all the sinfulness, all the unforgiveness, all the lack of grace. If we just allow God's love to come in, it wipes out unforgiveness. It wipes out bitterness. It wipes out anger. It wipes out hatred. And that's the type of love that God wants to flow out of our life. He wants to use His love to cleanse out all that nastiness that can be inside of us. So our spirit man is healthy and isn't loving selfishly, but is loving selflessly. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not easy. We all fail. We're all striving on this one. When we become dissatisfied with someone or something, we're still called to remain loyal and faithful because love is called to remain loyal and faithful, though it might be self-sacrificing. Can you imagine the power that would come forth in our churches, in our families, in our world if people just put that kind of love into existence? If we allow, the only way to do it is to allow God's spirit to well up within us. It's to allow, it's like, you know what, I can't love unconditionally if I'm not in touch with Jesus. If I'm not in the Word, if I'm not in prayer, how can I love someone else unconditionally if I'm not putting God into my life? Because it's only, only can I have God's love through His love flowing through me. So i got to be tapped into the source. Amen? You have to be tapped into the source. It's interesting because that whole verse on love is suffers long or love is patient. Another fruit of the Spirit I want to talk about is patience. Because patience has great power and patience is connected with love. Because if you don't have love, you're not going to have patience. Let me ask you a question. What has impatience ever done for us? What has impatience ever done for us? You know, I've started noticing, it's kind of funny. When I was young, and maybe I can still be a little heavy on my foot on the gas pedal. I'm from the Northeast and we kind of have that problem. But, but you know, I watch people who have to like zoom around you. You know, you're doing over, you're doing the four over the speed limit, you know, within that protected place. And they go whizzing around you. And then you all come together at the same stoplight and you get the space just in front of them because you weren't in the hurry. And you're like, okay, so you just risked your life and risked the ticket and did you even get ahead of me at the stoplight? What does impatience ever do for us? Impatience demands. It's harsh. It shows dissatisfaction and frustration. It creates arguments. It leads people to unrighteous behavior. Whether that's an emotional temperament of behavior, or whether that's we're impatient, so, so we, we, we lust after things we shouldn't lust after. We, it causes people to give up and quit instead of persevering. It terminates things of value. It causes rash decisions. And it really demonstrates a lack of faith. Pastor. Could you just pat us on the back this morning? Now wonder the first statement in unconditional love is love suffers long. Because if love is impatient, and if we demonstrate patience in our life, we are immediately beginning to create trouble in our lives. My kid, my son, was just three or four years old. I remember we drove down to Florida from New England, and we had this, we had this, this is a cassette. Wow, I'm going back a few years. It was a cassette tape. Wow. We were just happy it wasn't 8-track. Yeah. <laughs> Who remembers 8-track? I had an 8-track in one of my cars when I first started off. I was like, wow. And, I, and this cassette was, was, was Rappin' Roger Rabbit or something like that. Rappin' Rabbit. Did anyone remember? How many of you used to hear Rappin' Rabbit? The first one, Rappin' Rabbit? Any other song? I can't wait to have patience because patience is a wonderful thing. Hurry up, give it to me. Gotta have it now. I want it more than anything. This is taking long enough. Give me some of that patience stuff. I can't wait to have patience. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Wow. That, I mean, we're going back like 25 years there. 
But you know, isn't that the truth? Patience, it just rushes everything. We're in such a hurry in our life. Hurry up in that fast food window. Hurry up, waitress. Hurry up. We're so used to, I mean, now you ask a question. I, I, you ask yourself a question. I wonder what this is. Oh, just Google it. Oh, I got the answer. We get everything in a, in a split second. We don't wait for anything anymore. But the thing is, in life and dealing with people and, 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 and how we deal even when we wait for God because we pray and we don't see an answer right away and we get impatient and not being willing to have be long-suffering because that's what that word in the Greek means. Long-suffering. Everybody say that. Long-suffering. So in other words, it means when you're not comfortable when things are not feeling smooth and fuzzy being patient suffering through it until you see the right answers happen but we become very impatient because our fleshly nature comes out and it wants to take control of things often at other people's expense i'm guilty of this myself we can all be guilty of this impatient is toxic to our spiritual health and you know what else it's toxic to our witness. It's toxic to our spiritual witness. Most of us struggle with impatience and don't even recognize it. In the Old Testament, there's a story of Saul. You all remember when Saul, he was waiting for Samuel to come to offer the sacrifice? And he got impatient, waiting for Samuel to show up at the camp where they were to offer sacrifice to God before battle. And so he decided he was going to go take the sacrifices. And he decided he was going to offer the sacrifices because he was the king. But what he forgot to remember was he was the king, he wasn't the priest. God had called the priest to that role in that time, in that dispensation of time. And by doing so, in his impatience, God actually used that to say, I'm removing the kingdom from you because your impatience brought you to disobedience. And because you didn't wait for me, Saul, you didn't wait for my man to do what he was supposed to do, your family is going to lose your line and your sons aren't going to inherit the kingdom. All because he was impatient. How true does that become in our lives today? We're not willing to wait for God to work in a situation. We're not willing for God to work in a person. You know, God has to work in you, and you might have to work in your spouse too. And he might work in you in different lengths, at different speeds. But, but don't think that God isn't working in you, and he's only working in your spouse. Because when you start doing that, you're going to think that you're better than your spouse. And no one's better than your spouse. We want them to work in a marriage. Sometimes it takes time. Or in our family. Sometimes we don't like seeing what things are going on in the church. We want things in the church to be differently. But we have to be patient to see God working His plan out in the church. Because things just don't happen overnight. Sometimes you just got to give it time. So it's in God's time, not our time. When we're not getting our way in something, we can't go out and try to demand it. Don't get impatient with others. Jesus said in Luke 21, 19, by your patience, possess your souls. By your patience, possess your souls. You see, God wants our patience to be persistent. He wants us to stop pushing and to let go and to allow Him. 1 Timothy 6, 11 to 12 says, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Patience doesn't quit, but it persists. It persists in waiting. It persists in commitment. It persists in sticking things through. Man, how many more people would be better off if they had just been patient in their marriage instead of just giving up on it? How much stronger would churches be if people would just be patient for themselves, hopping from place to place? How much more can God do in our lives when we stop running from Him and stop in our patience to allow Him to work in His time frame, not ours? Because the power of patience is that it does not quit, but it waits. And in waiting, it stands through the test of time. You know, when I look at my own life and I realize I was a lot more impatient when I was in my 20s than I am now approaching 50. I can still be impatient at times. But I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to, and you know what? The only way I can actually have patience is by being in contact with the Spirit of God in my life. I've got to be in prayer. I've got to make sure I'm, having, I'm in my word. 
Because when those things don't happen, then I don't feel patience. In our world, instant gratification and expectation stands as a stark contrast to waiting on the Lord. But what does the Bible say? They that wait on the Lord shall do what? Renew their strength. In fact, James tells us in 1, 2 to 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. In other words, when you don't see the answer, when you don't have things the way you want them to be, when you're having to hold on and you can't see how it's ever going to get better, when you hold on trusting God, that's how patience gets worked out in our lives. Because until you've come through a few of those experiences where you've had to wait, and then you see God come through, you don't realize He always comes through. But He always comes through in His time, not ours. He goes on to say, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Well, I still lack, so I know God still has to work on my patience. Amen? How about you? But we need to allow God's patience to work in us. Because when it does, it's like releasing antioxidants if you're a superfood. When we do it, we release God's plan in our life. We release God's forgiveness in our life. And we release a whole boatload of trouble that could have caused us problems because of the toxins. Let go of them. And let God be God. Amen? Last, for this week is the power of self-control. Just like love and patience went together, I think power and self-control go together. Or patience and self-control go together. Amen? Patience is a part of self-control. Because sometimes we want what we want, but we want it now, and we can't control ourselves to not try and get it. The other thing that's wrong is that often we want what we want, and it's not what we should have. Are you hearing me? Can I tell you something? I want you to just repeat after me. I I am am not not an an animal. animal. (laughs) Say it again. I I am am not not an an animal. animal. Now I want you to say this. I I am am created created in the image image of of God. I love my dogs. I love. I mean, I love my dogs. I got two of them now. I love my dogs. I, I mean, I, I just, I hug them, I pet them, I take care of them, I nurture them, I give them walks, I buy them treats, I give them Christmas presents. I love my dogs. I'm not a dog. And as much as I love my dog, my dog is not created like I am. Nor is a horse or a cow or a cat or a chicken or anything else on this earth. We are created, if you were here on Wednesday nights, we looked at creation two weeks ago. We are created in the image of God. We have an eternal soul. I'm so sorry. Please don't get mad at me. But if you really study God's word, animals are not eternal. God didn't breathe the breath of life into them like he breathed life into us because he gave us an eternal spirit. But when he gave us an eternal spirit, we were created in his image To be like Him. Which means that we have the power of choice. Now we might have a sinful nature, but if you're serving Jesus and the Spirit of God in your life, your sinful nature is no longer reigning in your life because your nature has been changed to become the nature of Christ. Which means you have the power to say no to things in your life. You have the power of self-control. Because you're not a slave to those things. (coughs) Our world thinks that we can't help but give in to sinful impulses. Our world tries to feed sinful impulses. Our world projects indulgence in every way, shape, or form. Indulge in food, indulge in alcohol, indulge in in lust, indulge in sexual activity, indulge in money, indulge in greed, indulge in pleasure, indulge in whatever you want. But that's not God's plan. God has given us the ability of self-control. Because... I am not an animal, but I am created in God's image. Self-control is going to become much more profound in our life, much more easy if we're spending time in line with the Spirit of God into our lives. If we're spending time in the Word. If we're spending time in prayer, if we're spending time in worship, you neglect those things in your life, you're not feeding the spirit, but you're feeding the flesh. 
Galatians 5.24, Paul writes, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. It's a direct reference to exercising self-control. Think of the power of self-control. You know, there was a story of a missionary one time, you've probably heard it before, but the story of the missionary goes that, that this, this, this um, native man in the, in the village he was preaching comes up to him and says, Missionary, missionary, I, I, feel like, I feel like there are two dogs fighting within myself, and, and the dog, the one dog of sin, it's, just, it's beating out the other dog in my life. It's just fighting against each other, and, and that sinful man is just beating out the spiritual. And the missionary said, well, which dog are you giving more food? Which dog are you feeding more? If all we do is feed ourselves the garbage of this world, there's a reason why some of us, there's a reason why in Pentecost people said, let's stay away from certain forms of entertainment and media and music and other things. Because it just feeds ourselves the sinful concepts and ways of this world. And if that's all we feed ourselves and we can never break open our Bible or break it open into some praise and worship or spend some time with the Lord, we feed our flesh all the time, but we don't feed our spirit. It's just like when you decide to eat carb-free. You know, if you take white sugar and white carbs out of your diet, you're not going to crave them. It takes three to five days to get that out of your system. But if you don't take it out, that's why, that's why, those, that's why those low-fat plans never work for people. Remember, who was around in the 80s and 90s? And the big thing, if you want to lose weight, was low-fat. So people go, well, they're adding low calorie. There's only 100 calories in this candy bar. <laughs> but it's straight sugar. Which means it's going straight to your glycemic index. And it's revving up your insulin. And it's making you hungry. And it's making you crave. And we, if you take a cup of wheat and a cup of sugar side by side, wheat is higher than the glycemic index than sugar is. And it just puts toxins because our wheat is so filled with GMOs. I'm not trying to give you guys a lecture on food. <laughs> But because of that, it begins destroying our metabolism and the way we're trying, and the way and it works against our body to try and lose weight. But if you're feeding yourself lean proteins and, 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 and superfood vegetables, you fill up, you don't get hungry, and the cravings go away. So if we're if we're if we're constantly feeding the flesh, I know that when I go paleo when, in my food process, I can't put sugar in my system. Even the smallest of treats. Takes me away to where I don't want to go on that diet. But it's the same thing spiritually, church. We need to possess ourselves in self-control and we need to feed the spirit more than we feed the flesh. Paul writes this about the last days in 2 Timothy 3, 1-5. He says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control. Wow, does that sound like our society today? He goes on to say, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. He calls lack of self-control to be perilous. God wants us. He has given us the power to master our unruly desires of our flesh. That power exists within us because it's the spirit that dwells in us. The key is that we have to allow the spirit of God to rise within us. People are destroying their lives through drinking and drug use and gambling and sexual desires and anger and overeating and spending. We need to begin to to put off the desires of the flesh so they don't so, so they don't destroy us. Self control is powerful when released into our lives and it protects us against these things that are unruly, these things that are toxic to our spiritual man. That's why Christianity cries out. It's not, you know, all those lists of do's and don'ts of people say, oh, the church has all these do's and don'ts. I don't want to go to church like that. You know what? A list of do's and don'ts isn't going to save you. But the reason why the church talks about those things is because it protects us. It keeps us from destruction. 
It keeps us from going down the wrong path and doing the wrong things. It keeps us from having that toxicity in our spiritual lives. We wonder why we don't see the presence and the power of God moving the church anymore. It's because we're feeding the flesh and we're not feeding the spirit. And we've lost self-control and we've embraced everything in the world rather than trying to be set apart for Jesus. We live in perilous times and Christians are given to dangerous things. Our lack of love and patience and self-control in the church are evident and we see it in the brokenness of families and lives and churches. We see defeated instead of victorious people. We need to release what is already in us because what goes in is what's going to come out. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 2 to 11, and I'm almost done. I know I've preached a little long this morning. I'm just making up for being gone last week. (laughs) For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who living according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit... For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you... The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What does this mean? It means that the spirit in you has the power to help you overcome sin and to live according to God's plan for your life. If the fruit of the Spirit is love and patience and self-control, then you'll see those things coming out in your life if you're allowing the Spirit to dwell in you. If you're seeing those things lacking in your life, then maybe we need to be feeding on more of the things of the Spirit. Amen? To put more of those superfoods for the soul into our life, to feed on more of the Spirit of God in our life, so it can drive out those things that are toxic to our Christianity and to our spiritual lives. Because what goes in is what comes out. What we feed is what's going to come out of us. Teenager, realize that. Young person, young adult, realize that. You feed yourself a diet of, of, of the music of this world and the media of this world and the social media. All of those things, you know, there, there's good in social media. There's good in some music. There's good in some media. But you know, and I'm not saying that we can never have entertainment in our lives, but if all we're feeding ourselves is the garbage of this world, that's all we're going to get out of our lives is the garbage of this world. I want to close with this, 2 Peter 1, 10 to 11. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's feed the spirit, man. Let's start feeding on superfoods for the soul. Instead of all the toxic garbage foods that we can feed our spirit, man, let's feed on the things that God has intended to give good things into our lives. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me this morning?